We are officially online, Simon. Okay. You're in London. I'm in Dubai. How are things? Very good. It's a little bit overcast here in London this morning, but uh, happy to be here. Good, good. So what I thought if I do like a, a brief intro, so we're going to be recording this so we can share it with everyone who's, um, who can't attend today, but basically we met, Simon and I met uh, online without being at Tinder, but online so, uh, I was looking at people who had a great insight into retail and what was going to happen in retail. And uh, Simon Mitchell is the co-founder of an incredible company called Sybride. So um, they're behind uh, LVMH in terms of global store designs, um, Marnie, Joseph. And it's really incredible to see uh, from Simon's perspective what the future of retail is going to be like. So I have some questions from some of the designers who uh, emailed me. Uh, but really, the one thing, Simon, before we crack on, is one designer came up and said, why is it relevant for fashion designers and, and retail brands to appreciate architecture? And I thought that's a really good one to crack on. Uh, okay. so tell, tell us a little bit about, a, a bit about what your thoughts are around that. Well, I think uh, we all live our lives every day through architecture. You know, it could be a train station, it could be a cafe, an office, a gallery, streetscape, cityscape, landscape, um, you know, even our homes. And obviously retail is, is architecture. Um, so it's all form, it's all shape, it's all light, color, texture, smell, taste. Um, so I feel that a deeper appreciation of architecture um, and importantly, how people can experience these spaces, uh, touching all of the senses, um, I believe will lead brands to uh, have a better product um, representation. Yeah. And I think as we go on, because I'm intrigued to see what you're going to present, but I think the, the big thing is that people are thinking since COVID that we don't need the high street, we don't need shops. I'm a complete... I have a completely personal opinion on that, and I think you will have. So if we'd like to crack on, I'm going to just throw in a few questions as we go along uh, okay. where I feel fit, but I can't wait to see what you're about to present. So thank you very much. No worries. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, as um, Prior said, I'm Simon Mitchell, co-founder of Sybarite, and thank you to Prior and the Caviar Spoon team for inviting me to share my journey, which is a bit of a personal one um, that I'm actually sharing with you today. I've never done it this way before. So um, if I look at where I stand today, uh, I automatically think about the things that I that have had the most impression on me um, and that have shaped my vision. So I was born a creative. I have always looked through this uh, through a kind of futurist lens. So I guess I was born a futurist on many levels. Um, the slide here, the way I think about design is probably best and most eloquently put here by Eileen Gray. You know, to create, one must question everything. So I'm going to touch on a few of my personal and most important um, things that have made an impression on me in my life. And I'll kick off with, as a child, I, um, I caught a glimpse of the bubble houses designed by the Hungarian architect Anti Lovag. Um, these were in some of the magazines that my dad had printed at, at his work. Um, I was nine years old and I entered a school design competition uh, to design a house of the future. My design had a series of bubble houses sort of at the base for the bedrooms and it had a, like a rocket tower for so the living areas. I won this competition and I, I made the front page of my local newspaper which said architect of the future. So I guess my destiny was um, set then. So I looked much deeper into the work of Antti Lovag and I found further meaning in the narrative of his works. You know, he designed things from the inside out and uh, he controversially believes that the straight line is an aggression against nature. But I was um, truly fascinated by the, you know, these undulating and playful circular forms and how humans react and navigate within these environments um, in terms of movement and flow. And more importantly, the relationship that these forms 
play between the inside and outside, which was very important to the architect. So what would seem uh, an impossible shape to live in actually becomes a series of moments freely open for expression and interpretation. And this is when I realized that the power of combining the idea of blending all of the art disciplines. So on one hand, there's my very in instinctive and positive emotional reaction as a child to, to these bubble houses. And then with my experience as an architect, um, I understand a whole deeper meaning that uh, can relate to retail design. So um, let's get rid of this. Yeah. Uh, I was first drawn to uh, retail design by my, my mum. Uh, she would save up all of her hard-earned cash each month uh, to take a trip up to London and spend the day at Big Bieber in the early 70s. She would recite stories to me of the world of spectacle and discovery that she would have on each visit. And you know, she'd spend whole weekend there you know, and she loved it. But sadly, this was a, a brief moment in time in London for Big Bieber. And I only wish that uh, I could take a time machine back and uh, experience this. It was definitely the destination to be in its day. So all through my childhood, I became obsessed with inspirational form and shape for living and culture. Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim in uh, New York in the late 50s is still to this day a timeless and genius living example of how a gallery really doesn't have to be a series of box rooms. Uh, John Lautner uh, did, did a series of houses in, uh, in California. Uh, this one is the Elrod House in Palm Springs from 1968. And just like the bubble house before, it shows how powerful the relationships uh, of inside and outside, light, shade, form, function, all come together to create this uplifting, pleasurable and memorable experience. Um, as a young lad, I would uh, spend far too much time watching Stanley Kubrick's movies on my Betamax video tape recorder, not just for the, you know, the awesome set designs but also, and the great furniture, uh, Olivier Moog here, but most importantly, the compositions of every scene. You know, the, there are so many gorgeous single point perspectives layered with lots of silence in 2001 Space Odyssey, but also it was a great musical score as well. It gave me a, a real look at a sleek new space age aesthetic with flowing lines and surreal naturalistic forms. I also found inspiration in the Italian futurist movement, such as the work of Giacomo Balla here. And I find it incredible that in 1913, he was basically obsessing over the same thing that I was as a child, but he was just using a different 2D painted medium. Light, shade, color, movement, perspective, composition, flow, and speed. So my journey into retail was informed by several key moments which framed and reiterated my interest in the niche of retail design and architecture and ultimately drove me to design retail spaces that are above all experience led. So one of my favorites, this is Frank Lloyd Wright's 1948 retail store in San Francisco for the uh, VC Morris gift shop. This was used as a physical prototype or proof of concept for the Guggenheim Museum that was to come sort of 10 years later in New York. This store still operates today as a retail space. And at the moment it's housing a Italian menswear brand. It's remained virtually unchanged except for the brand and the product that's on offer. So actually, in fact, more than 50 brands have taken up residence uh, here in its 73 years of operation. What a fantastic return on investment and a testament to the design. Simon, on that note, what, I mean, I'm looking at this thinking, that is absolutely incredible, which obviously it is, but what is it about this that's stayed around for so long, in your opinion? Because so many retailers, especially in Dubai, you think we'd be so far advanced, but I don't think we are. Um, no. What is it about this actual design, which is why it stayed so relevant? I, I don't know if you've, I mean, there's a few, there's several things that I've pinched from this design uh, along the way, and I'll touch on them later. But what's beautiful about this is that the, the entire facade on Maiden Lane is just this, it's like a fortress of a brick wall, and it's punctuated by this mini tunnel. So you've got this vast, uh, 
I don't know how many square meters it is, maybe 120 square meter brick wall facing you, a small archway, and it you have to transcend from street to store. So there's an emotional uh, transference that happens. And then it opens up, once you go through this lovely glass tunnel, it opens up into this beautiful atrium and this swirling ramp system. It's just a gorgeous, uplifting, transcendent space to be in. That's beautiful. I love it. As soon as, as, soon as I saw the photo, I was drawn to it. Yeah, it's, I, if yeah. anyone's in, in San, San Francisco, it's in Maiden Lane. Please, please go there because it's, yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, in the 80s, uh, a few brave retailers started to catch on to the idea that it was architects that could bring a new narrative into retail design. And Czech architects Jan Kapliski and Eva Jurikna, they teamed up to create a new futuristic way in department at Harrods. But what I loved about this, it was the first time that I'd seen architects that were being employed to look at the entire narrative of the storytelling from branding, packaging, logo, interiors, art curation, multi-brand, lifestyle cross-selling. Um, I absolutely loved it. And you could argue that this is a very early example of um, what we're doing, what we did recently with SKPS some 37 years later. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that later in this presentation. So this is my, um, I was 18 years old. Uh, I just started my first year at university studying architecture. Um, and I went to see Nigel Coates' store. Uh, this is 1998 in, uh, for Catherine Hamnet on London's Sloan Street. Um, being a tr keen tropical fish keeper of myself as a child, I was completely seduced by the, the fish tanks in the window and the kind of post-punk pirate aesthetic that was completely and intelligently aligned with the wit and humor of Catherine Hamlet's collection at the time. So that I, I think this is really a, an epiphany moment for me of how powerful architecture and storytelling can be played out in a retail environment to tease human emotions. Um, you know, my tutor at university didn't like it because it encouraged me to explore more retail-based architecture solutions for my uh, coursework. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a year later, um, Eva Jurikna, she established herself um, as, with her credentials as the architect of the Joseph stores throughout the late 80s and early 90s. And she played on the, the brand's DNA and strength of the uniform with her stripped down aesthetic and the exposed componentry with her beautiful signature, signature technical staircases. Um, so... I naturally gravitated towards architects that blended these disciplines. And uh, immediately after finishing my degree, I went to work for Jan Kapliski and his architectural think tank called Future Systems, which was having a kind of peak moment for retail architecture and experience-led design. So it's perfect for me. Um, I felt that I was also destined to work for someone that embraced this uh, neo-futurism. So my first project um, at Future Systems was this tabloid dubbed Teletubby House in the Pembrokeshire coastline of Wales. Uh, this replaced an old uh, army, dilapidated army barracks, um, and it flew through the planning process because even in this uh, area of outstanding natural beauty due to the home's low impact design. Uh, it was bold, but you could argue not bold, but, and I also loved how it uh, divided public opinion. Uh, we went on to win the competition to design the new media centre pavilion at Lord's Cricket Ground. And this uh, fully embraced uh, shipyard boat building construction techniques never seen before in architecture. Uh, it, it also went on to win the Sterling Prize and to this day is a global icon in architecture. Um, you would have thought that the success of Lords for Future Systems would have cap you know, catapulted us into greater things. But actually, the fact was we were broke with no, um, no work in the pipeline. Um, but I was completely aligned with the vision and the kind of risk everything policy that uh, we all believed in in the studio. Uh, luckily, this all ended when Vittorio Radice, the new CEO of Selfridges, was on the top deck of a London bus traveling to work. He passed uh, Lord's Cricket Ground, caught a glimpse of this media centre, and miracles really do happen because within weeks we were appointed to design the Selfridges in Birmingham. I think Radice really understood the power of iconic architecture as placemaking for destination 
uh, retail. And uh, we treated this building uh, as a curvy pack of raban dress uh, on the kind of canvas of Eve Klein blue. And uh, the rest is history. And I think another global icon had been erected. So at a similar time, we, were, we struck up a re relationship with Comme des Garçons. Um, we collaborated with the founder, Ray Cavacubo, and the conversations we were having is, was really about the relationship between street and the store. So similar to the, um, the, the Frank Lloyd Wright store that I talked about earlier. Uh, in New York, we left the existing brick facade exactly as it was with the graffiti that's constantly evolving. Um, within this brick arch, we designed this uh, aluminium tunnel to incite and, ex uh, and create the emotion and curiosity of crossing this threshold between street and store, totally influenced by the Frank. <laughs> In, in Tokyo, we deployed a, a, a wavy ribbon glass of blue dots to play with this relationship between the street and store. And then also in Paris, uh, for their perfume store, we played a delicate game of getting around the planning restrictions of a protected building with a, a clip-on facade. This had a translucent fading pink film to give it the impression and sensation of being inside a perfume bottle. So everything in the store was white, but the subtle coloring of the glass film provided this ambiance and this relationship between inside and outside. So during my work at Future Systems, I met my business partner, Torquil McIntosh, who became uh, a right-hand man to help me realize uh, all of these projects. And we are, and still are to this day, it's totally polar opposites and from diametrically opposed backgrounds. Uh, but we had so many common interests and a rare one for our generation in fly fishing. I, you know, it used to be embarrassing for me to say to my friends at school that I love fly fishing, but I think I was definitely a misunderstood kid. But with Torquil, it was like having a brother from a parallel universe and, uh, and he was very posh. Um, we shared a joint love of virtue, you know, everything from sci-fi to wine, art, and also the pursuit of pleasure and everything otherworldly. So I would say that the Mani Milan project was a seminal moment for us as a duo because he's right-handed, uh, me left-handed, and we worked side by side on a large drawing together simultaneously, sketching almost telepathically without words to culminate in something quite special. I'd never experienced anything like this before with anyone. So it was a complete meeting of minds. We never look back and we remain each other's most harsh critic. Yet together, something always great happens. So we created Sybarite, um, aptly named for two people devoted to luxury retail with an experiential edge as the name denotes. Uh, the underlying line business driver was to be future facing, to be brave, experiential, innovative, and above all, maverick. We wanted to continue to work with visionaries where collaboration meant the symbiotic magic would happen. All apt for our generation, but interestingly, still relevant now as we travel with retail into the realm of the experience and immersive environments. And, uh, our recent SKPS project is a case in point, which I'll touch on later. So for Sybarite, we really wanted to demonstrate that we had the conviction to reinvent retail and experiment in a thought-provoking way along the way. Um, we wanted to deliver retail environments where fashion could merge with foundation. Creating a narrative was always the starting point, usually one which embraced experiments. And then in Ayama here in Tokyo, we, we did that full throttle. We did the total opposite to what the mainstream thinking was. And we closed off the main uh, shop facade with this giant stainless steel breast formation with a spy hole at its apex, just at the perfect height for a curious Japanese onlooker. Only um, originally the, the facade was mirror polished, uh, but it caused so many cues and reflections with passing cars slowing down, that uh, it became a, spe a spectacle that the authorities had to uh, step in and they made us apply a brushed finish. 
Um, inside the... But on that note, did you have any pushback? Because there's so many... Um, I just had a, a lady just text through going from a, a retail house just saying, if you wanted that to, to buy, it would be so hard to have. But what was the pushback? Was it the fact that they're so far advanced? They were thinking we need to be different. We need to innovate. Um, I think um, the, the great thing about Marni was that they were they were bold. Uh, Gianni and Consuelo really trusted uh, me and Torpo to, and they, they trusted our ideals and they allowed us to express ourselves. So the Japanese partners, we had loads of pushback. They were like, oh, you can't do this. This is, this is crazy. Um, but we knew, um, you know, as, I'll as I'll touch on next, you know, inside the spy hole, there's a fisheye lens that depicts uh, an almost aquatic store inside. So this kind of, it was intentional to drive the curiosity, chaos, and this kind of thirst for discovery. And how do, how do I actually get into the store? We knew this would work because in Tokyo, um, there are many intricate back alley entrances to even the most luxurious shops, cafes, and restaurants. And we know that the customer behavior was already um, navigating this way through these back streets. So uh, it was, yeah. It was a it was a amazing um, success, you know. Because if you go around, once you once you do find the entrance, this is the entrance around the back. Um, we didn't provide any wayfinding or directions to get there, but it's um, what's even more compelling is that there's a level difference between the this entrance and the the street level entrance where the spy hole is. Uh, so we ramped the entire store as well uh, from front to back with the flow and the energy culminating in the, the spy hole wall. Um, and yeah, I, I applaud the clients for be, being uh, as, as brave to support our Maverick approach. The, the, the store was a huge success. Um, and then in uh, 2003, we um, we. Joseph did a deal to swap his store with Marnie, his bigger store with uh, Marnie, who were in a smaller store. So we, they trans transferred stores and uh, our Space Age, excuse me, our Space Age store finally landed in Sloan Street in 2003. Um, it's, it's unique, it's still referenced today. Uh, it lasted for 15 years, um, not 73 years like Frank Lloyd Wright, but another amazing return on investment when most brands are Actually, I could, I could tell you that in the same period of time of 15 years that this store was there, Fendi had redone their stores four times in that same period. And so from that point, Simon, when you say there's an ROI of this design versus your standard walk-in rails, et cetera, how do they measure the ROI based on this kind of space-age design, this really cool design? Were they basing it on longevity of customers staying in? Was it cost of sale? What was the metrics they used for that? Well, obviously the, the simple metric is you've, you've got a, you, you sign a, a 10 and then it, they extended it to a 15 year lease. Um, you know, uh, obviously your operational costs and you know, you know, your number of drops that you're going to do each year. Plus, you know how much money you're spending on me as, as the architect. And also we have to work to a budget within their business plan of their targeted sales to so we achieve a construction cost per square meter. And um, I can tell you now the, the, the price that we were spending here was it's a miracle that we, um, well, actually, it's not a miracle because we did it, but um, compared to the brands around us and our neighbors, a fraction of the cost. Yeah. And did you, do you feel that when this actually launched, it was then the other brands are going, we need to create the experience. It can't just be a shop and a rail. Oh, it, def it definitely starts, it triggered um, a knock-on effect of other brands up in their game. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, with this store, uh, what, what was nice about Marnie is that we wanted to weave in design coding into each um, and every store that represented some local or cultural sensitivity. So it's not obvious with this one, but there's subliminal co coding. So there's the red and white echoes, the St. George flag, the red London bus, the red telephone box. And also, not many people know this, but it also references the Natural History Museum just up the road with the... The, the dinosaur skeleton in the lobby. So we used this stainless steel display to connect everything uh, from 
both floors, rail, shelf, surfaces, products, all together in one seamless flowing sculpture over the two floors. And no product was placed on the walls at all, which was also a unique thing to do in its day. And then with Alberta Ferretti, a completely different client, uh, the most important thing for her was to have uh, volume to her products and uh, complete and total flexibility to move them around. So our design interpretation was used, we used magnetic busts, hangers and shelving so that every single product placement was flexible. Um, uh, so we took something that was very couture, beautiful and fragile, and we gave it shape and practicality. The VM team loved us because they could literally change out the store in an entire, you know, in, within hours. I love this. Yeah, but so, so what's, the, um, what's the centimetres between hangers as well, Simon, whilst we're on this one? Oh, um, <laughs> there, are, there are many brands that want to squeeze it to, you know, five centimetres. No, 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 no. So with Marnie, we, it was fixed. Um, we set it at 20 centimetres and we even had a hook. So there's no way that any sales assistant or customer could get it wrong. So every, space, every garment had space to breathe. And with Alberta Ferretti, um, it's magnetic, so actually you can put it anywhere. But because we had um, bust formations for the, for the hangers as well, it naturally gives at least 20 to 25 centimetres per product on the rails. Um, so for Stefanel, we had a massive 750 store uh, rollout program over a five year period. So we had to come up with a concept that was way ahead of its time. And we devised the giant Lego kit of component, components. Each piece is uh, prefabricated seamlessly to fit together easily by anyone, from the smallest franchisee store to a 5,000 square meter directly owned flagship. Everything here is plug and play and interchangeable. Even the fitting rooms are modular. And this is an example of the store in Hamburg, uh, 2,500 square meters two stories, and we fitted this out in just one week, reducing the store closure time and obviously the loss of profit to an absolute minimum. The irony here is, is that it actually took us longer to remove the old shop fit than it was to install the new one. So in many ways, you could uh, this could be even be channeled now as a, in terms of the pop-up concept. Uh, pop-ups didn't really exist uh, in the same concept when this was conceived back in 2008. And then um, Joseph Etagui, uh is, was an icon in retail and a, a great collaborator, a great friend, uh, a great mentor and supporter of Sybarite from day one. It was actually his encouragement that helped us take the plunge to start Sybarite. And we learned so much from him. Um, essential lessons in terms of vision, customer expectation, behavior, navigation, cult loyalty to brands, and the importance of constant newness and collaborations. And we used this strategic advice and weaved it into our retail designs for Joseph. And his thoughts and observations remain embedded in our work today and we miss him terribly. So um, our reputation at Sybarite was growing um, and so was the scale of our work. So I want to quickly take you back in time to show you how that can inform the future. And I want to talk about some of the department store greats uh, and their heritage. So Le Bon Marche in 1838 was arguably the world's first large scale department store. The core house style remains relatively unchanged to this day. It's inspired so many forms of art, design, literature, such as Emile Zola's The Lady's Delight uh, book. Uh, its inception was to overwhelm the senses of its female customers, forcing them to spend with an array of buying choices by juxtaposing goods in enticing and intoxicating ways. It really worked. And mail order was completely revolutionized by Le Bon Marché in the mid 19th century. They were, you could say, they were the Amazon in France in the mid 1850s truly iconic and it's still a pleasure to visit every time that I'm in Paris. In London at the turn of the century, uh, Harrods was trying to replicate the same theatre and total decadence of retail. I love nothing more than trawling through 
historical archives of retail back in the day and how it can inform full circle behavior today. Uh, I mean, just look at the space that's given to the product uh, and the customer here in this 1919 exquisite shoe lounge. And the detail there is phenomenal. I mean, it, it actually leads me on. Can I ask you a question, Simon, which has come from one of the ladies? Her name is Sarah Burns. Sarah is an ITV uh, stylist. So yep. she um, stars Francesca Mane and uh, various other people and works with amazing designers. And she actually um, asked this question, and I'm just reading it out here. I've always seen the power of a pop-up, but notice enthusiasm is waning. What makes it memorable for emerging designers and brands? Um, this picture says a lot, but what is it in your opinion of all of a year's experience of being mentored? What is it that makes that pop-up memorable? Because it isn't just a rail and two designers together. There's got to be, there has to be so much more, I guess. Yeah, I, I, the first part of the question, I don't necessarily agree that the power of the pop-up is waning. I just think it's that operators are becoming a little bit more greedy and as the competition for these spaces intensifies. And th this, I think, is wrong because pop-ups are there to bring newness, you know, create more customer engagement. And it should always be a, a three-way mutual benefit, you know, operator, brand, and customer where everybody wins. Um, I guess you could look at... What's a great example? Louis Vuitton and Supreme. You know, they were, I think uh, Louis didn't, Louis Vuitton, they were suing Supreme for use of their logo sort of about a decade ago. But, but now they've kind of, they've hugged it out. And now they regularly come together, blend in their identities to, to create pop-ups all, all over the world. But the customers have been known to queue for over 30 hours, I think. Yeah. Well, the last uh, pop-up or collaboration with Louis Vuitton and Supreme, they had six only, only six pop-ups around the world and they sold the products. And now the products, even if you have the bags, whatever it is, if you go on a pre-loved market, it's still 80 to 100% of the cost. So the, the return on investment is phenomenal, but they only kept six strategically laid out pop-ups. Yeah. Those two brands, which are actually from a collaboration point, you could look and think, wow, you know, two quite different brands, but it really worked. Yeah, uh, they used to hate each other. Now they they now they're in love with each other. It's it's brilliant. Yeah, I think also you know to avoid the operators, you know, Alexander Wang and Adidas, they also did um, a pop up in the back of a truck. So they just pull it up in like Soho in London and open up the truck, yeah, they get a parking ticket and they get told off by the police, but by then they'd sold, sold out their new drop collection. I think it's uh, brilliant. Yeah, it was a parking ticket amongst a few thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with regards, we have another lady who, um, she was talking about pop-ups, she said, what, you know, is it a case of just looking for another designer to work with, putting up a, a, a pop-up? But I think, you know, looking at this, is it about coming up with a theme? So then coming up with a theme, coming up with a story or an experience and then run it through. I and mean, is there a methodology to get this pop-up um, pop ups correct? Because I've been to some which has been such a shame of amazing designers, but it just hasn't got any buzz about it. You walk in, walk out. Yeah, I, th I think you have to have that single one takeaway, don't you? So I think the brands need to understand if they're going to do a pop-up, it needs to be just really, the takeaway needs to be completely off, obvious. The, the, the product, it can be really a small product offering, but make it really gorgeous and also um, make the service from the staff that are, are, are selling this product, make that impeccable. Because I think service is something that's really, really overlooked. Um, I think, you know, I think retail has become really lazy in recent years. And I think uh, we all need to, to work harder to make the experience so much better. Thank you. No worries. Um, where was I? So Harrods, yeah, gorgeous. I mean, if I, if I click on to Lorena Shente, same period, uh, you know, these were all grand houses of style and pleasure. Um, everything is curated everything is multi-brand multi-layered you know like i said re i think retail worked so much harder in the past and i think we need to re-engage with these lessons moving forward so i'm a you know i strongly believe in the original premise of bricks and mortar um 
And I think the department store uh, still stands up today. You know, essentially, you know, influence and innovation are key. Uh, they sh they are, and they should always be exemplars of new trends and curators of newness. They should always be showcases of innovation, architecture, and engineering. Uh, they must have economic importance. You know, both import and exports. They must provide social and cultural interaction, and. Like, I, you know, customer service is something I learned from Joseph himself. It's got to be exemplary. Mm. And that's whether it's in a, you know, a boutique shop, department store, I mean, it's the service stands out. It's the number one. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably my number, one of my biggest lessons I learned from Joseph is the, is the, you know, the importance of great service. He was, you know, to watch him at work in his store in Fulham Road was nothing short of, spectacular yeah he would make the customer feel so special like they were the center of the universe and um, he'd encourage them to try on things that they hadn't previously considered mixing his own products with uh, other designers uh, i think he's unique because he was i think he's one of the only brands that's sort of a mono brand and a multi-brand at the same time so uh, yeah. it, to have a meeting with him in a store was impossible because his eyes would be everywhere. He'd be watching the customers and he, and he would pounce at the at moment. So if a customer had taken something that he was really interested in or didn't think it would be appropriate for that customer, he would, he would just immediately interact with them. Or if they just come out of a fitting room and they tried something on. I mean, it, well, he didn't do it in a creepy way either. He had so much charm and charisma and, and they had, the customers loved him. And he really had the pulse of his stores. So yeah. Service, customer service. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, I think this back to the future research that we constantly do uh, informed our work for Shinkon Place. Uh, so from 2010 onwards, we were focusing our sites more and more on Asia for new business development. And Shinkon Place was a relatively successful shopping mall in Beijing, but the client had much bigger ambitions to become a Chinese iconic department store brand to be known globally and spoken in the same breadth as uh, Harrods or Le Bon Marche. So in 2012, we were invited uh, to an exclusive competition to, to reinvent them. We knew our competitors. We also knew very well, more or less, what those designers would, would do, which would be a kind of traditional architectural or interior-based solution. But we took the total opposite approach and we were asking ourselves, how could we give instant heritage an iconic state status that the client so desperately wanted? Um, the answer was, um, was, was not about an interior design solution. It was about everything from the name to the branding, to the staff uniform, to the curation of the product offer, and ultimately changing the, the house style. So we knew that most locals called it uh, SKP. So we changed the name, proposed this, and we, we developed a new logo out of the ch client's uh, favorite Chinese character for rice. And you know, if we weave that in with a load of uh, both historical cues, Chinese and Art Deco, as well as color association, which is really important in retail. You, know, you think of green, you think of Harrods, you think of the yellow, primary yellow bag, you think of Selfridges. So this new timeless SKP pink logo was born as if it were already 100 years old or designed yesterday. So from this branding exercise, every design element flowed from that language, be it the door handles, the lift buttons, escalator screens, signage permits, the wayfinding, the floor patterns, the, the elegant and graceful column detailing, the, the uncluttered and gorgeous sculpting of the ceiling. Everywhere you look, SKP house style. Needless to say that the, the client awarded us the, the contract and nine years on now, our relationship continues to, to bear fruit. So we approach every project from micro to macro and vice versa, as we always have done. Uh, and we were, I guess we were growing up, you know, approaching two decades of design. SKP is very much a combination on many levels of everything that we have learned, uh, but we couldn't have done it without any of our partners and the collaborations that we work with every day. Um, and we always like to work with uh, best in class and collaborate on a shared vision because we know how to you know, how it can add value uh, 
And we apply this kind of stand out from the crowd approach, a cause that we've always been dedicated to. So, you know, we know we're greater when we collaborate. And in SKP Beijing, for example, this took a monumental team effort to all round uh, to refurbish the existing 140,000 square meter shopping mall into an iconic department store over a three year period whilst keeping it trading seven days a week. Uh, we work with so many brands on a daily basis. In this, you know, in the beauty halls alone, there are over 120 brands that all want to shout louder than their neighbors, but we listen to all of them and we come up with a set of guidelines that each of them has to uh, adhere to so that they can all live harmoniously together under a single house style for SKP. Uh, the results speak for themselves and I think SKP have seen a near 20 fold increase in the turnover in the beauty halls from its original shopping mall days. Uh, in SKP Xi'an, it's a whopping 20 floor, 250,000 square meter department store. It is the world's largest luxury department store. There are more than 1,000 brands represented here. And such is the speed and growth of new luxury local Chinese brands. More than 40% of the local luxury brands represented in Xi'an, their Western counterparts probably have never even heard of them. Um, so in you know, consistency of this house style is, um, and constant curation of the offer is, I think, what makes SKP the success that it is. You know, they work really, really hard at their brand relationships, and it definitely shows. You know, retailers that work hard and that are able to change, adapt, and constantly bring newness and fresh collaborations are those that uh, will survive. And the thing that we love most is that it looks like it could have been built yesterday, or 50 years ago, uh, and that was, the, that was the intention. You know, as well as the core department store offering, we are constantly questioning and diversifying the SKP family into new brand extensions, uh, from new restaurants where there might be a gap in the offer to lifestyle concepts and through to their own cinema brand. Uh, an interesting fact is that the cinema business in China, just for local films alone, is bigger than the entire rest of the world cinema business co combined, such as the, uh, the appetite for, in China to, to venture out uh, and watch a film, but also wrap it around other experiences. So in um, what, let's say, what does shopping on Mars look and feel like? This was a question that we collaborated on and, and posed to our clients. They are perfect for sci-fi lovers and devotees of space and futurism, but uh, really what we were asking our client is, how brave are you? And uh, he didn't flinch. And SKPS is, is based on a surreal experience of stargazing into the future of retailing. It's essentially a, a hybrid model between the analog, the, the tangible real, and the digital immersive or new worldly. And it was a collaboration with the Korean retailers, Gentle Monster. The idea is to create a, a luxury laboratory operating in real time where brands delve into their alter egos, uh, a fueled and fluid momentum driven through space, which uh, culminates on Mars. And convention is completely overhauled here. Uh, with SKPS, we have forged a new identity or, or a new blueprint for a department store. And we're working from the, the principle of experience per square meter and not sales per square meter. It's about people, it's not about numbers. And more than 65% of the floor area here is dedicated to experience rather than product. So customers show up at SKPS to participate in an experience. They're not walking in with purchase intent. Uh, the transactional aspect will flow naturally if you provide the experience and the curated offer. So it's about lifestyle. It's about understanding Gen Z customer, um, their desires and predicting their aspirations you know, because ultimately everybody's time is the most precious commodity. So on the outside, it was an opportunity to stamp the, the house style of SKP over the building. So this, this also gives it the, the house, the ability to adapt, morph and evolve in time on the inside 
whilst remaining timeless to SKP on the exterior. And at night, the facade is lit up like a Chinese lantern that, uh, that dances across the facade and changes color and lights up the, the landscape piazza that we created outside. The lines between retail, hospitality, entertainment, education, and gaming now are continually blurring and blending. And our way of thinking about is about agility, pivoting, and not just riding the wave and look into the next one, but we'll look into the ones after that as well. We all need to break boundaries and navigate the, the landscape with like-minded collaborators. Um, robotic conversations between past and the present and the future take place throughout the entire customer journey of SKPS, right through to um, the first settlers on Mars and their future farms and how they provide their nutrition. So the entire, you know, you, you move between experiences as if you're living on a space station with, uh, with smaller and less obvious and more intimate product offerings along the way as well. And the entire, let's say the entire experience questions, like what do you feel like having traverse space and looking back at all those planets? It's bonkers, but it's, it's, it's really, really amazing as a, for, for a customer to do this. You know, we're, we're really pushing the brands outside of their comfort zones. Customers love it. You know, here with Byredo, you know, a fragrance and accessories store, for them, the narrative was about, create, was about a meteorite that falls to the earth, and the store then acts as a web, uh, as a lab where customers can perform perfume testing within a flammable cabinet. It's amazing. Um, yes, Simon, let me just ask you a question on that though as well. Is, you know, no one's really, no one's inventing anything new. So it's either perfume, it's creams, it's dresses, it's shoes. But you've hunted, and we've spoken about this, when we're, we're both hunters of the next winning brands you know that next Louis Vuitton the next swimwear brand you know but what is it that you look for so you have a big team who hunt these brands and I think you introduced about 350 to this more didn't you a, we, we're always uh, not not 350 to this particular one because I don't think we have 350 brands in SKPS but uh, yeah but we're always encouraging um new brands like SKP Select is, uh, is basically a multi-brand uh, selection but through the buying team. So the buying team are constantly touring the world, looking, un they understand their customer and they're always uh, looking for a product that can, that can bit like basically they're doing what Joseph was doing for years and years and years, but just they, they know that some of their customers, particularly in the pandemic right now, they can't get to some of the European brands. So they're, they're constantly blending and creating an edit that changes every three to four months. And we do this with every client that we work with. We, we make suggestions who we think will be a right fit because we live, you know, we're architects, but we love the subject of retail and we live and breathe it every day. So um, we're looking for brands that are fashion forward or ones that seek reinvention. We look for authenticity. You know, you know we don't, you know, please don't be a product that uh, looks great but is really bad quality. Um, and we're always looking for a story behind a brand, you know, and brands that want to be brave. You know, like Byredo, brands that want to be brave enough to have a conversation about having a meteorite in their shop. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But it's all about the meaning, isn't it? So you have these so many brands which are coming through, but it's what is it that hooks them? Especially, I think, if they're privately owned, so, you know, we have a lot of privately owned brands and actually, personally, for skincare brands, sometimes, a lot of times, I'm hooked to the owner and then the brand after, but there's something about the owner and the story of why they created the brand that is, it, it's the why, and then you buy the product. Exactly. And if you can do that, if, you're, if your architect understands that and uh, your customers understand that and your, and your buying team understands that, together you can, you can make something like, you know, I talked about subliminal design coding. You don't, you don't shove it in their face, but customers understand, you know, for SKP, it's the house style everywhere they look. You know, be it the simplest act of pressing the lift button, but it's, it's a curated lift button in the style of it. 
SKP. So they feel that they're in something really special. Yeah. And then with the Marnie stores, it's just this subliminal coding. There's no cookie cutter approach. To, you know, every Marnie store is different. So the customer wants to go to the Tokyo Marnie customer wants to go to New York to have that experience. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a just curiosity. It's, Every, everything is, is, is connected. Yeah, it's amazing. I love it. Um, so, yeah, in SKPS along the way, um, it's also about reinventing concepts such as um, the grand tour here. You know, what would you collect on, on your interplanetary journeys and bring to your home on Mars? And we also have um, robots and AI that work continuously on sculptures live every day in the store. So whilst SKPS is seemingly very different, it's always about selling the dream, you know, seductive and spectacle driven. And as designers, we must deliver this. Uh, if, you, um, if you read between the lines, the past absolutely does inform the future. Um, but reward is, often, is most often found on the, on the road, less traveled. So we intimately understand that bricks and mortar store will always be a temple to pay homage to, and it's wrapped in the promise of escapism. It has the power to fuel imagination, uh, to influence culture, to disrupt, to make or break a brand. Um, and as designers and architects, we adopt the mantra that you're, you're only as good as the last project that you delivered. Uh, the quest to be better is what drives our vision as a business. And, and we know that to do that collaboration is absolutely essential. Um, I'm going to end on uh, SKP Chengdu. Uh, I can't show you everything because uh, of my very strict NDA, but I, this project combines everything that Sybarite's ever worked on and, and it has the scope to collaborate the, the greatest. It's a master plan like no others. It's 340,000 square meters. It will be another first. It will be the world's largest luxury subterranean retail park in the world. Um, the irony is, is that it sits directly opposite to the biggest um, building in the world, which has 1.7 million square meters, the global center in Chengdu. Um, but this is proof that SKP and SKPS are forces to be reckoned with. Nothing except the entrance canopies uh, are above ground. So we are, we are giving back uh, 120,000 square meter public park. And then if you drop um, below ground level, um, at the first retail level, it's, it's a, the art, the architecture, the landscape, interiors, and public transport, as well as the thousands of brands and F&B experiences are all fused together to create a truly memorable destination. And we're working tirelessly now to make this happen for spring 2023. Um, back to the words of Eileen Gray at the very beginning, you know, to create one must question everything and we need to deliver clarity uh, and relevance in a multi everything age by continually transforming the retail environment to remain relevant thank you wow simon i want to know what you guys think of when you've had a drink or two that is... well, we, we love we do love a glass of wine <laughs> that is incredible i think guys we're just going to be doing a, a couple of q and a's so if anyone has any questions please grab the moment. But I do have one which um, has come through from Alexandra Miro. So Alexandra has the most incredible swimwear range. Yes, um, I, I know yeah. the brand. Oh, phenomenal. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. And what Alexandra has said is, with the rise of digital, how important are physical spaces? Can you not just do this via digital and online channels to minimise costs? Surely that makes sense. So I wanted to finish on that because what's your, what's your take? How are you going to finish this off when all of these people are saying retail, the high street, the malls will die and it's all going digital? What's your take on that, Simon? Can I have, uh, can I have a few minutes to answer that one? It's, it's, it, yes. needs a, it, it needs a long answer, I think. Um, you are right. Yeah. Alexandra, you're, you're right. In you know, Communicating through online channels is obviously a more cost-effective solution, but um, it does limit your reach to those customers who might not set out directly with the intention to buy swimwear. Um, you know, it, what about those customers that may have set out just to meet a friend for lunch, do a bit of shopping together, 
spend some quality time together, um, and maybe they just want some instant gratification. You know, so to them, let's say those two ladies, your products are completely invisible. Um, and I think swimwear is really like um, a little bit similar to lingerie. You know, they have one of the highest online returns rates um, for, you know, for fit or it just didn't look or feel right. I guess there's also a sustainable question there um, with deliveries and returns. And obviously there's also a number of damages that you have to consider as well. But I think most importantly, customers prefer to physically touch, um, particularly swimwear. Uh, you know, they need to try them on. Is the material too thin? Is it too thick? Is it stretchy enough? Color is a big thing with swimwear um, that you cannot accurately portray online. And I think this is where the power of fitting rooms plays such an important role. And God, I, I could talk about fitting rooms for hours. It's one of my favorite subjects. Um, but also, I guess it's about your price point as well. So with Alexandra's current costings, I, I'm, I'm assuming she's direct to consumer. So she may not be able to go to ho wholesale, which if she did, I guess may reflect on her, her direct costings and therefore outprice herself in the market. So I, yeah, it's a delicate balance, but I would, um, if I was Alexandra, I would talk to as many um, buyers in as many department stores uh, and malls that have multi-brand um, swimmer and lingerie departments. Um, and I would also, she might consider running a small pop-up or a temporary store, you know, with a rent-free period for a limited and a kind of in-season number of weeks to understand what footfall and traction that she can gain. But um, if she does this, please, please, please ensure that the fit and room experience is one of the most important bits within the pop-up and make it a luxurious space because um, I'm telling you, fitting rooms are so neglected when nine times out of 10, they are the most effective weapon that a retailer has. Uh, if you look at the stats, more than 50% of customers that use fitting rooms, they normally go on to buy three or more items. But at the same time, you could probably argue 95, 98% of the people, they don't enjoy the experience, you know, discomfort, stress, bad lighting, lack of space, can't take a selfie um, for Instagram. There's not enough hooks, or in my experience, the hooks are normally broken, lack of immediate assistance, no wing mirrors to see their rears. Um, they can't do, they can't quickly charge their mobile phone. There's no room for their friend. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there's so many um, parts to it. So just imagine what sales would be like with amazing fitting rooms. So if you had a swim uh, pop-up with the most amazing fitting room experience that makes your customer look and feel fabulous, that in itself would be a much talked about medium that could go out on all the other online channels. And I'm sure the sales would, uh, would benefit from that. Well, it's like the Instagram fitting room. It's a bit like the Annabelle's bathroom. Yeah. I've never seen it so many people, you run up to the bathroom to take a quick photo because it yeah. is an experience when you go in there. We did this, um, we did this fitting room for Joseph uh, in um, Singapore and we, we, we dedicated so much space to it. It was, uh, I'm, I'm so glad I got away with it because actually it's, it's proved to be brilliant. And there was a photo that, that I saw on Instagram by this, this girl that came in with her friend, tried on, and then the fitting room was designed to basically make, make her look amazing. And this, it really, it warmed my heart when I saw this picture because she just looked, you know, she wasn't a model. She, you know, she just went in there to try on some clothes with her friend. Friend took a picture. She looked stunning. And I was just, it's like, yes, that's it. Tick. <laughs> <laughs> and that's some of the final one because we've gone over, but I don't care because it's been amazing. The top rule about creating a successful collaboration, the one thing, your one piece of advice, because collaborations, as we know, are not just let's switch over a database. It's a strategic marketing cog. So what's the top rule um, from Sibrite when you're looking to collaborate with other brands? Just, just make sure that uh, if it's a collaboration for a pop-up, say Alexandra is going to do a, a, a collaboration pop-up, make sure that there is one simple takeaway message that the customer goes back and just, and it's, it's like it becomes ingrained in their brains that so there's, a, there's an emotional connection with the product and the experience. 
Simon, thank you so much. I want to give you an online cheers. <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant. I've just learned so much from that as well. And uh, I think everyone will be thanking you. Um, oh, Claire, look. Claire is an amazing events manager. So she understands about the detail. Um, so, yeah, thank you again, Simon. And any questions, guys, if you have any more? Oh, there's actually one here. I'll just clear. If you have any more questions, send them across to me, mary at the .com, um, and then I can pass them over to Simon. So, Simon, thank you so much. And just to confirm your website, Simon, it's sidorite.com, isn't it? Yep, that's it. Perfect. Lovely. Thanks again, and we'll be in touch, and I'll see you soon. Right. Thank you very much, Brian. Right, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.